Eating Goose, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit today about your new book, Saving Catholics. Uh, but before we get into that, can we, can you just tell everyone a little bit about your story? Give us a little bit of background about you. Right, well, I've, I've been in this area for the last 40 years or so, um, in the lower Blue Mountains, and during most of that time I was teaching at the Australian Catholic University, which prior to that was the Teachers College yes. from North Sydney. So I've been involved with education all along, and more particularly religious education and theology. Mm. And uh, during that period, of course, we had Vatican II, and then the implementation of Vatican II. So it was a constant thing to observe how well we were doing in trying to implement Vatican II, or not implement it. As the case might be. And now, of course, it's caught up to us with the Plenary Council. We're back visiting a lot of the things that were raised at Vatican II. I've been involved at parish level with our parish, liturgy committees, uh, pastoral councils, and also uh, the Ecumenical Council of New South Wales. And I've been involved in local ecumenism. So I think I've, I've looked at different levels, if you like, in church life. And I am very much concerned with the lack of implementation of Vatican II, the challenges that are presented today, the crisis, the crisis today with the sexual abuse. Yeah. I mean, that has really brought to us to a second reformation. It is profound. Mm -hmm. And it's only beginning to bite. Do, do you think there's been a, this has been exacerbated in the last few weeks with what happened in America with Cardinal McCarrick and uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report? It has, and in other countries too, France for example, the, the Cardinal of Lyon. But Italy too, I don't think, has really begun to process the whole thing either. So I think the next 10 or 20 years is going to be fairly critical in terms of coming to terms with sexual abuse and how we manage it. And so it's exciting times. During that time we've seen the churches empty. My personal church now is down to less than 50% of what it was 5 or 10 years ago. Uh, so they, this, those sort of issues raise the question of what sort of church are we going to have in the future? Mm -hmm. If people are, are not in church now, and we're getting older and greyer, what's the next generation of church going to look like? Mm -hmm. And where are they going to come from? Mm -hmm. And so all of this is the sorts of questions you're asking in this book. So was that the impetus for writing this book? What, what was the impetus for the writing The whole particular impetus was we were talking about the coming uh, council, plenary council, and I looked around me and I couldn't see any book or material that would encourage people to sit down and talk about their, their experience of church. So I thought, why not? I'll have a go. I've got some ideas and I'll put them down. Mm. And I'm hopeful that people will use the book, not only for the plenary council, but in years to come, if they want to talk about reform, yeah. uh, it might be a useful aid. Yes. So, so that was the impetus, and mm. then got in touch with the publisher, and away it went. Morningstar picked up and ran mm -hmm. with it. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the book. One of the one of the things that I like, uh, mm. you know, when people are talking about the reform, they usually hone straight in on everything that's wrong, whereas you've taken a, a different approach to that. Can you yeah. talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I certainly gave it some thought. Uh, you want to avoid taking up always a negative position, always criticising, and you need to look at the positive side of things. So I thought, in writing books such as this, what about beginning with the good things about church? We've heard so much negativity and in the light of the sexual abuse, you can understand that. But are there good things about church? And let's identify them, let's talk about them, and let's appreciate them. Mm. And keep them, keep and them keep going. Them. Yeah. And what are they? <laughs> what have you found out? 
Well, liturgy obviously is one. Experience of the sacred. Experience of good liturgy. Um, experience of belongingness. And I think a lot of people miss out on that today. If you belong to a good community, they sustain you. Mm. They help you. And, and church fundamentally it does that for us on a purely human level. Mm. Mm. Um, so I think they should be appreciated. And might I also say here that I think one of our problems is the consumerism of Christians, of churchgoers. They go to church, they expect to receive Mass on time, good liturgy, uh, communion, uh, and then they go home. They, they don't think of what can I contribute to the community. And we've got to turn that around. You mentioned clericalism. Well, uh, consumerism is another big problem because we have absorbed it from society in which we live. Mm. But we expect the church to give us certain things. We don't say, what can I offer? Mm. How can I contribute? Well, I can remember being very young and uh, it wasn't about us at all. It was, you know, you, you did go to Mass and you got what you were given, if you, mm -hmm. if you will. You went to hear Mass. You went to hear Mass, you didn't go to participate in yeah. Mass. Uh, so, so much has changed in even my yeah. lifetime, you know. It's I can remember Mass in the Latin. I can remember the women at the back of the church clicking their rosary beads yeah. and while the fellows were up on the altar doing their thing with their, with their backs to us. Or out the, out the back door having a smoke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned clericalism and of course that's one of the things that you, uh, that you single out in your book. Can you speak a little bit to yeah. your take on clericalism? Yeah, well, um, it's an attitude that we absorb that the church's practice clericalism, which means a hierarchical structure where those at the top feel superior to others and act in, in certain ways, feel that status is more important than anything else, and also have a secretive nature of going about their work, as if other people shouldn't know details about the parish finances or appointments and so on. So we grow up in this culture and we don't realise we're inside the culture. And it takes a lot of reflection to break through that, that mould. And that's what we've got to try and do. And there's a lot of laity too with the, the clericalism mindset, right. you know, isn't it? Uh, you know, Father knows best and... Yeah. And the bishop of worship, the bishop says... Yeah, is the initial true? reaction is to point the finger at the ordained and say they are guilty of clericalism. But in fact, Clericalism only continues because lay people endorse it by the actions, by what they say and do. Mm. Um, you wrote this book sort of as a way of examining some of the issues that might be taken up in the plenary council. <coughs> uh, how do you hope that the book will be used by people? Well, well I hope that individuals or groups of people would sit down and use the book as sort of a framework for discussing different topics. Mm. The book doesn't try to take up a position or resolve issues, but merely expose them and get people talking about them. I mean, one of the, one of the things that's unique, I think, about this book is that it's not just a talking head telling you about things. There are thought conversation starters, mm. there are questions, targeted questions throughout. So it's something that a, a small group, for instance, would be able to utilise very well, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. The way each chapter is sort of designed. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of what each chapter sort of does, if you will? Right, well, uh, as we mentioned already, the first chapter talks about the good things um, th about the church. Uh, and we mentioned those, belongingness and good experiences of spiritual matters. Uh, chapter 2 talks about the negative things, uh, and that's basically the culture in which we grew up and of which we have now got to learn to be critical of if we're going to make any uh, progress. And it focuses, and now this reminds me, focuses on, on the Gospels. 
in a way, uh, this book follows uh, Pope Francis's encyclical on uh, the, what was the one? The gospel, the the one he wrote about the gospels. Anyway, gospel of joy, the, the, the joy of the gospel, yeah, the, the, the joy of the gospel. Yeah, okay. And in that, he sets out a framework of, of reform. And I have been absolutely amazed that parishes don't seem to have reflected on that. They don't seem to have advertised that. They don't seem to have realized what a big call it was for reform. Mm. Well, well, one, right of, over their heads. one of the things in one of those early chapters uh, where you quote Francis, uh, it, I think in that uh, chapter that's critical and things that are wrong with the church is the infantilization of the laity. Oh, yes. Is, is that one of the impediments to the growth? That it sure is. The, and I think that's a, a manifestation of clericalism. It's a great expression, that, isn't it? Yeah. Infantilization of the laity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Graham English has got a cartoon there. My dear little children, mm, yeah. and um, that's the way they often treat the lady. But, but it, it was a part of this culture in the church of you know grabbing young boys, you yeah. know, 12, 14, uh, before they reach puberty, taking them into minor seminaries, and they were sort of emotionally and mentally stopped at the age of around 14. You know, yeah. Richard Sipe called this culture of forever 14 mm. and uh, but we lay people also were not encouraged to mature you know you went to yeah. primary school and what you learned there was your 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 baggage of of faith information religious yeah. information spiritual information that was to do you for the rest of your life yes. um, yeah people have commented on that haven't they that in a way, as people grow up, they learn a lot about the banking system, uh, the work of, of the, the work experience area, other areas of life. But in religion, they remain stunted. Mm. They never develop an adult understanding of it, mm. uh, which is sad but true. And hence, uh, what was his name? Cardinal of Milan said, "The church is 200 years behind the times." Mm. Yeah. And young people today, age 40, say to me, you know, how can the church still operate the way it does? Because mm. they come mm. from the professional world, in which they have good standards, and they adhere to them, then they go to the church and they treat it like children. Mm. Mm -hmm. two, of the, two of the chapters that you talk about in the book are all about reform, aren't they? Mm. Uh, talking about reform and talking also about the challenges to reform. Yeah. Um, that material was drawn from uh, Francis's take yes. on, on reform? Yes, it would have been. And also, in all church history, really, mm -hmm. all attempts at reform over the centuries, as well as Francis's big push for reform. Mm -hmm. And he continues to do that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he continues to repeat is that priests should be in the job because they are serious about spiritual development, mm. not because they're looking for a career. Yes. And he keeps on saying that, so he obviously thinks that's an ongoing problem. Yes, and of course you end the book with reflections about the Pope and how it, you call that chapter Hope Through the Pope. Yes. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, I guess all organisations, if they've got an inspirational leader, someone who can really lead, uh, people are encouraged to follow. Mm. And Francis is a character like that. He's, he's been adamant and straightforward in what he says. He believes what he says. And he practices what he mm -hmm. says too. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the things he's, that he's, he's done in Rome. He's, he's also facing a fair bit of pushback from right, elements yes, in the church, yes. which we didn't see in the last two pontificates. No. Um, what's the difference? Why, why is he generating this pushback, do you think? Because it's biting, I think his reforms are serious, mm. whereas the other reforms have been fairly slight. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, a profound difference is that his experience was from Buenos Aires, a city 
working with people in parishes. Mm. It wasn't uh, sitting in an office in Rome. That's not his background. Mm. So he's come to the job with quite a different perspective. With the smell of the sheep on him. With the smell of the sheep on him. Mm. And just another point on, on the seminary reason that I think in a way we should close down the seminaries <laughs> and start again and ask ourselves what is the best way to prepare people for that role. And it's, if we it's, choose it's more leadership, people, building communion. Uh, they're the key roles, aren't they? That's you right. know, building community, building communion, and, and you know, providing leadership. Right. A um, lot of for a lot of parishes, that's happening with the parish associate, who's often a, a, a religious sister, yeah. and uh, and they do some amazing work yeah. in community building and keeping their keeping their communities vibrant and and working and alive. That's right. Uh, but it's very lay top heavy oh, rather than yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, clerical top heavy isn't it and they have no aspirations career wise no. they're doing it because they're really convinced of the value of the job yeah just to quote a line from your book on page 39 we need a paradigm shift in catholicism away from fear and towards love mm -hmm. Um, can you give us a, a view as to how that is expressed? You know, how do you build a paradigm of love to replace this fear that we were, we yeah, were brought up yeah. with our generation? And I suppose it goes back to basing one's spirituality on the Gospels and focusing on the love of God as seen through Jesus uh, rather than on negative things, rather than focusing on evil and sin and the devil, as some people do, educating young children, mm. which is dreadful to give them that sort of introduction to Christianity. Um, so it's only by doing that consistently, I think, that you will build up a culture of, uh, of love rather than punishment. And but, I mean, but my, my sense is that that one of the great assets of the Catholic Church in Australia is the Catholic education system. Mm. While people have given up going to mass, mm. they're still sending their children to Catholic schools, even if they <coughs> don't take them to mass on Sunday. Mm. But uh, it seems to me that you do find that paradigm of love generally in the Catholic education mm. system. Yes. Um, what, what's your experience? Because for a long time you were in tertiary yeah. education, but you were, would have been teaching teachers. Certainly enough, the schools have been very good at that, yeah. yeah. And the ones that teach religion in those schools that are properly trained will teach a religion of love. Mm. It's those who are not trained, who have a, a false understanding of the Bible and what's going on there, that, you know, that educate children in fear. And then, of course, too, like if the Catholic Church changed and withdrew this rule about having to go to Mass every Sunday and said, we encourage you to go every Sunday, as the uh, Orthodox churches do, as the Ukrainian Catholic Church does, they're not compelled to go, but they invite it to join in the divine mysteries every Sunday. Wouldn't that be much better? people would be encouraged to go because they want to do it, not because you might go to hell if you don't. Uh, in your book you quote what are called the seven precepts of the Catholic Church. Oh yes. Uh, I'd forgotten clean all about them until I was looking through the book again for this yeah. interview. Now, one of the things, I'll just briefly recite them, to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, um, uh, and resting from servile works, to observe the days of abstinence and fasting, to confess our sins to a priest at least once a year, to receive our Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist um, once a year during Easter season, to contribute to the support of the church, to obey the laws of the church concerning matrimony, to participate in the church's mission of the evangelization of souls. 
Um, mm -hmm. uh, you, you've got some discussion in the book that, mm -hmm. that, that there's, I've read out seven, but there are five in, yeah. the, in the catechism. Um, one of the things that it seems to me that, that's, that's a big problem for the church today is that a lot of people I come across simply don't believe a lot of the uh, things that some consider as fundamental laws. You know, mm. for example, they don't fear that they're going to go to hell because they've missed Mass on Sundays. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the participation rate in confession is mm. even less than in uh, going to Mass and yeah. receiving the Eucharist. Um, you know, the, the, uh, people are no longer even bothering to have a Catholic funeral. You know, mm. they get a funeral parlour to, yeah. to, to do the ceremony. Or a Catholic ma marriage. Eh? Yeah, mm. yeah. You know, it, it's falling off enormously now. They're those precepts of, uh, what were they called? The, um, the, the, the seven precepts, precepts of the church. Of the church. Yeah. Uh, you know, now, when you've got that sort of uh, falling away from, from even believing those things. Yes. Um, you know, I, I pick up from, through our community that people don't even believe in the virgin birth anymore mm -hmm. as a literal event yeah. or the resurrection as a literal event. Yeah. You know, now the church has, in a sense, always called those as mysteries. But some people have tried to literalise them as, mm. you know, literally Jesus yes. was resuscitated, he wasn't resurrected. Yeah. What's your view and, and how can that be challenged through plenary council or the process that's going on in the church now of, of these, this falling away from the fundamental teachings? Well... It's a difficult one, but let me start by saying that I'm part of a small group of people down at Emu Plains who meets and discusses some book of interest on spiritual matters. And through that, we are challenging each other and developing our own thinking. For example, God. This is Richard Raw's book. But God, so a better word for God is flow flow of energy. God's not a person. A person is what we are. So God is flow. So we begin to think more deeply about our religion. And I guess we're moving in the direction of mysticism. Because in the olden days, things were so simply explained. We all knew what God was. We all knew all the answers. Now we're beginning to explore the depth of the transcendent. So our thinking will be at different levels, at different stages, as we work through what exactly is the resurrection. What do we mean by virgin birth? I challenged our pastor to explain to the congregation. He descended into hell. Would you care to tell the congregation what that is? Because they say that every Sunday, and I'm sure no one knows. No. So it, it's uh, a progression a deepening of your understanding of the mysteries. Do you think the future might be in small groups and in a sense going back to the original foundation of house churches? I hope so. I hope so. I think that is our... Well, South America have had that experience and it's worked there, small groups. Uh, the parishes are too big in many cases and you've got to form smaller groups to get any nourishment. I think people are beginning to realise they have been getting no spiritual nourishment from the larger parish mm. for whatever reasons. So let's have our own small Bible study group, our own prayer group. Our Lenten group. Our Lenten group. Yeah. One of the things I'm finding in my experience in communications and setting up uh, discussion forums on the, on the internet in cyberspace is that one of the big problems is time. We're, we're all imprisoned by time, you know. Uh, no matter how rich or poor you are, you can't get more yeah. than 24 hours in each day or however many minutes yeah. that is. And so one of the, 
that has a, an effect on how big a community we can belong to comfortably mm. because you can't have a conversation with a thousand people yeah. uh, intelligently because there's simply yeah, not yeah. enough time to listen to the other and to respond intelligently. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me the, the, there is some uh, inherent natural limit mm. to the size of a community that each person is comfortable yeah. working in. And I, I suspect that somewhere between 50 and, and at, at the limit, 200 people. Mm. Um, you know, it's a problem for us as, as publishers yeah. because we need an audience of in the thousands yeah. or millions to defray the costs of, of, of actually mm -hmm. uh, organising a website yeah. or publishing a magazine yeah. or something. But the reality is that at the local, at the individual level, we're most comfortable when we've got a group of friends mm -hmm. that we're intimate with yeah. and it's, it's fairly small. And so it's interesting to hear about your ex yeah. experience. And I suppose that's been duplicated now with the plenary council. There are a number of smaller groups in my parish, but they're coming together next Sunday and each group is going to report on what they've been discussing. Mm -hmm. So that'll give the larger uh, understanding of what people are thinking. Now, now the, the interesting question is, is who has facilitated that in your local community? Two people were appointed to facilitate that in our local parish, but there's at least one group that wasn't part of that organisation that has been meeting by themselves from about three months ago. So they did it themselves. Mm. And that's part of the movement, I think, away from clericalism. Mm. You don't have to be told to get together and discuss an issue. Mm. Just do it. Mm. And, and how did that, that group come about? It was just a group of... Through people. dissatisfaction with a number of practices in the parish. Mm. Right. And uh, when you say there were facilitators, were they appointed or were they elected? How did they come about in for, the parish? For the first group or the, no, the parish? No, uh, the parish, they were appointed by the parish priest, yeah, which yeah. is the old model. And, and yeah. but it's worked, is what you're it's, telling us. As far as I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah and you, you'll find out more next Sunday. Next Sunday, yeah. Um, so that's, that's interesting to hear. Now, have you had any feedback from further afield, you know, other diocese around the nation? It, well, except ten. Newcastle have been very active regarding the plenary council with Bishop Wright. Uh, I've been in touch with them in terms of looking to launch the book there. Uh, Brisbane and Perth, well, the, the Archbishop there is aware of it too, of the book, and um, the plenary council is moving on there. But I haven't got specific feedback from other places. Yeah. Perhaps we will over the next few months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I hope that uh, Saving Catholics does wonderful things. I hope everyone uh, gets a copy and, and uses it particularly in their discernment process, particularly leading up to this plenary council, but also, as you say, beyond that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good primer and it's, it's a good workbook mm -hmm. for people to be able to... Uh, not just discuss these issues, but look at how they can make concrete changes uh, and the questions that, that can be asked. So, uh, congratulations on a wonderful book. Thank you. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing it on every coffee table. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you.